So glad to be with you all on this beautiful Sunday morning, uh, June 12th it is. Uh, what a day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Amen. amen. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, I believe Dave Lucignolo brought over some vacation Bible school yard signs. Uh, so if you would like to put one in your yard, please see either Dave or Amy Leak in the narthex, the foyer, the entryway, after uh, service this morning, and you can have one to take with you and, and put in your yard. Um, announcement number two. Uh, remember that after today's service, I believe, Ryan, you're going to be picking up the sheets from out here, correct? If there's a hymn that you would like to hear at some point during this summer, um, we've got a sheet for the 9 a.m. service and a sheet for the 11 a.m. service. Is there, if there's a praise and worship song or a hymn that you would like to hear us do uh, as a part of the worship service this summer, write it down on those sheets, and Ryan is going to be collecting them, and they're going to start incorporating that into our worship planning for the, service, for the summer. And number three. Having come back from annual conference and set in on various meetings with the Wesley Covenant Association, Global Methodist Church, United Methodist Church, and so forth, and this navigating the water system and, and the overall condition and health of our denomination, um, I feel pretty confident now that we've got a way forward. I feel like um, it's going to be pretty obvious what we need to do. Uh, I was saying this morning, I feel better about it than I have in probably the last three or four years because it's become so obvious where we are, where we need to go, and the pathway to get there. So throughout the summer, we'll be having various uh, sessions that I will be attending with the bishop, the district superintendent, some of the other churches. And as we're doing so, we'll have listening, conversational sessions here at the church as well so that we can get all of our questions answered and, get, and go through the discernment process together as a church. But I feel like it's all unfolding in a way that's pretty straightforward, clean cut, and it's just, um, just a matter of making it happen. So um, that's about as far as I want to get into that right now, but just know that um, that's something that we'll be working on um, quite a bit in the upcoming months. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning in worship. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be together uh, in church together as a community of believers, a community of faith. Um, God, we ask that you'll help us to be relaxed and to leave any unnecessary distractions behind so that we can be totally present in this place at this moment and turn our full attention to you and to worshiping you, God, and to, and to sing your praises for what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. God, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And now, join me in the call to worship. As a shepherd seeks a lost sheep, so God seeks and saves the lost. Like a woman who searches for a lost coin until it is found, so God rejoices over one soul restored to wholeness. As a father receives a returning wayward son, so God welcomes us and lets the past be the past. Therefore, let us praise God in thanksgiving that we are received. Let us receive and welcome and rejoice over one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Please stand for our next, for our hymn, Holy, 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 found on page 64 of the hymnal.
everlasting and the golden crowns for on the glass is he. Cherubim and seraphim pouring down before thee which word cannot and evermore shalt be. darkness find thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory cannot see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Shall praise thy name in it and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You may be seated. And at this time, we'll have our Psalter reading. Uh, the response can be found on 743 of the United Methodist Hymnal. And after this, after the Psalter reading, we'll go into our prayer and then the response from the choir. And after that, the children may be dismissed to go to Children's Church with Miss Amy. chanted above the heavens by the mouth of babes and infants. You have set up a fence against your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. Many and great, O God, are thy things, maker of earth and sky. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, and the mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little less than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever has the long paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Many and great, O God, are thy things, maker of earth and sky. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are so gracious that you consider us as lowly as we are, as small as we are in comparison to the glory of all of the heavens, that you consider, that you still consider us in your mind. God, you look after us, you watch over us, you lead us along our paths. God, you lower the mountains, you raise up the valleys. 
to make this path of life tolerable and navigable. Lord God, we are so thankful for the blessings that you bestowed upon us as a church. God, today we pray for all of those who are traveling. God, we pray that you will bring them back to us safely and bring us back into our fold as a congregation to worship with us when they return. God, we pray for the many in our community and even in our church congregation that are suffering various afflictions, physical, mental, psychological, and in any other way, God. We ask that when it's in your will that you will restore them to a full uh, restoration of health, God, and completeness in mind, body, and spirit. And God, when that's not in your will, we understand. We know that all things work to your glory. But God, we ask that in these times, you will bring about that peace that surpasses all understanding, knowing that regardless of our station in life, regardless of the trials and tribulations uh, which we are enduring right now, that you are indeed right beside us. And that in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we have an eternal friend who walks beside us and leads us along our path so that we can walk faithfully on the journey of ours, knowing that your presence is with us always. God, we are drawn to you by your grace and our, our hearts through the Holy Spirit cry out to you, Abba, Father, we know that we are drawn to you, God, but sometimes we don't have eloquent words. We don't have things to say. What do we say when we approach your throne, throne of grace, God? What words in the human language are sufficient to express our love for you and our adoration for all that you have done? But God, in these times when we don't know what to say, we know that we can come to you confidently as your children and pray to you with the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Many and great, O oh God, are thy things, maker of earth and sky. Please stand as you're able and join us in our second hymn, How Great Thou Art, found on page 77 of the hymnal. And at this time, the children are dismissed to go to Children's Church with Miss Amy. Mountain grander, 
and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to me. How great the heart, how great the heart. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to me. How great the heart, how great the heart. And when I think that God has sung the swearing, sent him to God, I still stand taken in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great the heart, how great the heart. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great the heart, how great the heart. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. You may be seated. And now for God's word. The Old Testament reading is Proverbs 8, verses 1 through 4 and 22 through 31. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way at the crossroads she takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the portals she cries out to you O people I call and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. Stand as you are able for the gospel reading, please. It comes from John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, 
but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Our New Testament reading this morning from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. These are Paul's words to the church in Rome. He says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your spoken word this morning. God, I ask that you strengthen me where I'm weak. God, prop me up, and yet hide me behind the cross. God, so that all things will be to your glory and not my own. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm preaching from Romans this morning. All of our passages today came from the lectionary, which I'm a lectionary preacher, and I go through um, the lectionary each week. There's four passages. I choose which one I'm going to preach from. And it was kind of a toss-up this week. I didn't know... It would have been very easy to preach on wisdom and what Proverbs tells us about wisdom being from the beginning. So I'll say a brief word about that that you can just sort of store under your hat and think about it later. But it says, wisdom was with me from the beginning before I created all these things. I think it's interesting to know that in the book of John 1.1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that came into being came to being through him. Well, wisdom, uh, the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia, which is feminine. And uh, the, uh, the word that we speak of as being with God in the beginning, the Greek is logos, and it is masculine. The logos is the masculine counterpart to wisdom, which is the feminine. So in the book of Proverbs, when it says that wisdom was with me from the beginning when I created all things, that is a testimony to Jesus Christ being with God from the beginning, just told in a different manner in the New Testament. But I can't preach on that today. I'm preaching from Romans. So let's get into the book of Romans chapter 5. Now Paul gives us uh, a few lines here. He's talking about boasting in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. So I want to sort of unpack these individually and talk a little bit about it. I think that we know intuitively that suffering brings about something positive. It's like we each know deep down inside that there's some sort of connection between suffering and virtue. There's a certain virtue that comes with suffering. Now I want to tell you a story, um, a harrowing story of survival and triumph of my grandfather and his commitment to his education. Because you would not believe what my grandfather had to go through to get to school each day. Did you know that he had to walk uphill both ways? <laughs> he had to walk it in the snow barefoot. Um, and I suspect he had to fight coyotes and wolves along the way as well. We've all heard these stories. Um, and we've heard exaggerations of them that somehow in the past there was this great suffering. And there's a virtue attached to that suffering. I thought of one a little more humorous when the uncle came to visit town, came to town to visit the family, and he asked his nephew, he said, son, how old are you these days? And the nephew said, I'm nine and a half. The uncle scoffed. He said, when I was your age, I was already 12. <laughs> There's a certain innate characteristic uh, um, that we have that 
that um, that somehow this suffering that we've endured produces something good. And Paul expounds on that in the passage today, and that's what we'll talk about. Why do we take so much pride in having overcome adversity and having lived these difficult lives? Um, You know, I was speaking with a a mentor of mine a few years ago, and I remember we were riding in the car on our way to go get coffee, and I was telling them about just some nitpicky stuff in my life that was aggravating me and causing me problems. And at the end of, of my little spiel to him, I, I said, but you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, considering the suffering that takes place around the world, my problems are really insignificant. And he said, no, Sean, they're not insignificant because suffering is suffering. And I thought about that, and I, I thought, you know, that's right. The Buddhists, for thousands of years, have said that to live is to suffer, that they are inextricably linked, that life itself is one long process of suffering, and that you have to accept that suffering, embrace it, and learn to overcome it. Um, in Christianity, we, we use the... Um, we will say, take up your cross. That is our version of life is suffering. We say, pick up your cross. And I believe it was Julian of Norwich, but I can't remember who said, your cross is right in front of you. You need not go around seeking it in all these places. If you're looking for the cross that you have to bear, it's probably right in front of you if you open up your eyes. And you just have to pick it up and carry it. So suffering is suffering. We are all going to suffer. And if we're lucky we'll have the opportunity to choose the manner in which we will suffer. But sometimes we won't even do that. But the kind of suffering that transcends social class and economic status um, is really a suffering of the spirit, I think. When our loved ones are sick, it doesn't really matter how much money you have in your bank account. Um, When the doctor says, I'm sorry, there's just not much of a chance here, Um, whether you're rich or whether you're poor really doesn't make a difference. That suffering is going to be about the same. When our faith begins to falter, it really isn't important what we do for a living or how our bank account looks. We have a certain poverty of the spirit, and that transcends the socioeconomic um, spectrum. So suffering is suffering, but, and the suffering of the Spirit, I think, may be the kind that we can all relate to. But we boast in our suffering because we know intuitively that suffering produces endurance. In other words, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. I look at how Paul suffered. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says that five times he was sentenced to the 40 lashes minus one. So that's a sentence of being whipped 200 times, and 195 of them were carried out. He was beaten multiple times, imprisoned. Um, He was given a thorn in the flesh, and he gave himself up for the sake of the gospel and for preaching the gospel throughout the region. So Paul knew about suffering. Um, But how do we actually suffer in a way that brings about endurance? I came across a story Uh, from the town of Enterprise, Alabama. I had never heard of Enterprise, Alabama. I have no idea where that is, but this was an interesting story I came across. This this town of Enterprise, Alabama, their primary industry was cotton. All around the region, around their little town, they all grew and harvested cotton. Until 1919, when the boll weevil came through, and decimated their entire cotton crops. That was a devastating blow to this community. So in the next few years, they had to experiment with different crops that the boll weevil wouldn't be able to interfere with. So they began to plant peanuts, they planted corn, they planted wheat, and it was a really tough time for two or three years. They were in deep poverty, they were struggling to get by, It was very, very difficult for them. But ultimately, they found out that the new crops that they were growing yielded a greater return on investment than cotton ever had. So now, in growing these peanuts and and the wheat and all these things, 
Now they were prospering more than they had before. So a few years later, they decided they were going to erect a statue in the middle of town. Do you know what statue they erected? They erected a big statue of a bull weevil. The very thing that has, had caused their suffering. Because they understood that were it not for that bull weevil coming and decimating their crops, they would not have been pushed out of their comfort zone into that which was going to bring about something greater. So they erected a statue to that thing which had caused the very suffering. Now I think we all have our own bull weevil experiences. We have financial reversals, professional failure, relational disappointments, psychological or physical hurt. But these trials can serve to bump us out of our old ways and force us to find new ways to live our lives. Many tragedies can turn to triumphs through the grace of God and through the perseverance of mankind. And our passage today illustrates how suffering may indeed turn out to be a blessing. As with Paul, we all may exult in suffering because it is the path to spiritual maturity and glory. The patriarchs and saints of our Judeo-Christian faith tradition would agree that trials and difficulties many times paved the, paved the road to the kingdom of God. Abraham would tell you about the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Jacob would tell you about sleeping on a pillow made of stone. Joseph would tell you about a dungeon. Moses would tell you about his trials with Pharaoh and the sufferings of leading a people in the wilderness for 40 years. David will tell you that his beautiful songs came to him in the darkness of night. Peter will speak of his denial of Christ. John will speak of Patmos. And Christ will speak of the cross. Suffering produces endurance. In the Greek, the origin of endurance means something like to remain under pressure, which leads us to the next line that Paul gives us, that endurance produces character. The word character used here has its origin in a group of words having to do with the refining of metal. Character, then, is the pure metal that is left when the refining process is complete and the dross has been burned off. It's the combination of pressure and time, after all, that turn a, worth, a worthless, ugly lump of coal into a beautiful and valuable diamond. Being under pressure and remaining under pressure can be the process that builds us into something far more valuable than we were to begin with, something beautiful to behold something that is worth putting on display for the whole world to see, something so precious that you would give it as a single gift to the one that you love the most. Having continuously endured sufferings and building endurance, you have developed the character of someone who is patient, who has a godly worldview, someone who doesn't take small things for life for granted. You have the character of a diamond, hardened under pressure, heat, and time. And you are now beautiful, precious, and priceless, not only to the world, but in the sight of God. Suffering and hardship ultimately bring us to know God more fully and to emulate the life of Christ in a way more fitting of a people called Christians. The unimportant distractions will be burned away from our minds the way that iron is purified in the furnace. Subsequently, character produces hope, hope in the glory of God. When we overcome adversity, when we endure suffering, the character we build is of someone who has been refined and now sees the world through a slightly different lens. Someone who has suffered from and overcome addiction, for example, may see the world brighter and the colors more vibrant than before. In biblical terms, we could say that something like scales have fallen from their eyes. Someone who has been healed of a serious illness may begin to take the time to stop and appreciate the smell of the flowers and marvel at the everyday beauty of God's creation, which we often overlook and ignore. 
when we are enduring difficulties, food doesn't taste good, jokes aren't funny, nothing is pleasant. Our entire world seems dark and bleak. But when we persevere, and by the grace of God emerge from a time of darkness, the sun begins to feel good on our faces. The breeze is cool on our skin, and the air is a little bit lighter than it was before. We notice these things because our character has been changed. Another result of having endured suffering and emerging from it is that we, it will become obvious and undeniable that we live in a world created and governed by a loving God. When we take the time to observe nature, to look at the way trees, flowers, and leaves are formed, we see the handiwork of a supreme being. As our character is changed, we begin to find ourselves imitating Christ. At first, like a child learning to draw letters, God holds our hands and walks us through the motions. But after a time of commitment, we begin to form the letters ourselves. We are no longer being Christians, we are Christians. And because Christ existed from the beginning, and all things that were created were created through Him, we see God's creation within ourselves. We begin living as Christ lived, seeing as the Spirit sees, and loving as God loves. And finally, love does not disappoint. When we view the world this way, we also recognize that there is much, much more. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Lewis, in this quote, is observing something that I think we all know intuitively, that this world and this life is not all that there is. Galatians 4, 6 tells us, Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Our very souls cry out in spirit for that which is eternal and greater than what we experience superficially. In this journey through life, we are given a glimpse of what, eternally, of what eternity may be like. We are given a window into paradise when we see beauty and glory in the midst of darkness and decay. We see God's creation in our world. We see it when we look to the heavens, and we see it when we look within ourselves. We develop the hope that there will come a time when everything bad will be overcome by all that is good, and we will live eternity in peace and joy in the presence of Christ Jesus, along with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father in eternal bliss. This is the hope that does not disappoint. This is the wish that comes true. This is the dream that, comes, that becomes reality. That which we hope for or long for will come to pass as we have been promised in the Bible. We have been given a cause for hope in the grace that is bestowed upon us. Jesus suffered immensely so that our suffering might be short-lived and that the various sufferings in this life will equip us to more clearly see God's glory in our midst. Rejoice then when trials come our way, for we know indeed that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Jesus Christ died not only for the believers, but for the unbelievers. And it is God's desire for you and for me to be brought into the fold of His everlasting love. Amen? Amen. offering.
Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. Lord, this morning we ask that you will help us to be responsible stewards with these resources that belong to you and to your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. of faith. I believe believe in God the Father Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in our final hymn, My Hope is Built, which can be found on page 368 of the hymnal. Oh, 
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness falls his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His hope is covered, and his blood supports me in a whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, but less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. May the love of the Father enfold us, the wisdom of the Son enlighten us, and the fire of the Spirit kindle us. And may the blessing of the Lord God come upon us and remain with us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.